I'm uh, Greg Pretty. I recently joined the Center for the National Interest as a senior fellow uh, dealing with primarily with the Middle East. And we have with us today Faras Maksad, a senior fellow and director of strategic outreach at the Middle East Institute, and Jonathan Lord, a senior fellow and director of the Middle East Security Program at the Center for New American Security. We're gonna be discussing questions surrounding the current US efforts to promote an agreement for normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel, a very timely topic given reports this morning that Jake Sullivan and Brett McGurk uh, have arrived for another visit to the kingdom. Um, and uh, you know the Saudis have, have also made some asks to the US as part of the package on security, um, on nuclear cooperation. Um, so we're going to be addressing, you know, what are the prospects for success, uh, taking into account this week's momentum events in Israel as well, um, and also should the U.S. be willing to offer some of those security guarantees or major non-NATO ally status or things that the Saudis have, have looked for uh, to show U.S. commitment to the security uh, relationship. Um, and so with that, I will uh, hand over to Faras and uh, let you make your introductory remarks. Greg, thank you so much for having me here today. It's a pleasure to reconnect. You and I go uh, go way back and we're colleagues at some point at a different lifetime. So it's a pleasure to reconnect. And uh, thank you for the Center for National Interest for hosting this important dialogue. And Jonathan, great to be on a panel with you again. It's always a pleasure to, to have that discussion. Um, I'm going to keep it short and I'm sort of very much looking forward to the Q&A and the discussion that will follow. I'll make a few points. I always like to start on an optimistic note. Uh, given what we all know about the region, and then maybe finish off on, on a maybe a bit less optimistic note, but maybe with a few recommendations of how we can get to, to where we want to go. Um, I would first, sort of the first point I would make, I would say that the issue of normalization when it comes to Saudi Arabia and, and Israel is a question of, is no longer a question of if. It's, it's a question to my mind of, of when and, and how. Uh, and those, those are just as crucial uh, in terms of being actually able to get there. Um, and in kind of sort of addressing this how and when, I think it's important to understand what are the drivers on the Saudi side? Why are we sort of seeing uh, such a significant change in the leadership's position on these issues and a willingness to entertain a policy shift that would have been unthinkable uh, just a few years ago? Um, and whether that is sort of whether that jives or uh, sort of a, runs in parallel to what our strategic objectives here uh, are in, in, in the U.S. and sort of where the Israelis are and what they want out of the process. So and my answer to that is I think that there's quite a bit of daylight. Uh, in fact, the Saudis don't talk much of, of normalization. Uh, and the word normalization in, in the Arabic political lexicon has taken on some negative connotations. And I think Hezbollah and the, you know, the pro-Iran Arabic media has done a good job in tainting that, that word in Arabic, Tadliya. Uh, Tadliya is, has negative connotations today for most Arabs. And so the Saudis prefer much to, to talk about integration, uh, regional integration rather uh, than normalization. And uh, you know, regional integration, they will very quickly point out, would then include Israel. And it, that is interesting for more than one reason. One obviously reflecting sensitivity to political um, political opinion, public opinion, and we'll talk about that in a bit, uh, but also kind of the underlying drivers, which is the point that, that I wanted to make. And any one of us here so who've spent time listening to, uh, to Mohammed bin Salman, uh, better known as MBS here in DC and in, in the West, the Crown Prince and Prime Minister of Saudi Arabia, and I've watched more interviews for him than I'd like to admit in, in the Arabic language, um, quickly realizes where his passion and heart is in terms of uh, where he wants to take his country. This is a, not your typical Arab leader that we've sort of accustomed to, that I was accustomed growing up to, which is, you know, that, that authoritarian that spends all his time talking about geopolitics and geopolitical ambitions and, you know, the struggle against Israel and the Arab cause and coloring uh, the language in Arab uh, nationalist or in religious uh, terms. Uh, the man talks about economics, economic diversification, um, integration, regional integration, FDIs, KPIs. Um, there's always a space to talk about regional politics. It's always the minority at the time. He spends 
the overwhelming majority of his interviews talking about the economics and finance of things with, with great passion. And so it's not a surprise to me that I think the Saudi approach towards this issue of normalization with Israel is one that's based on the vision of where they want to take their country and its place in the region. And in the realm of talking about his vision 2030 uh, and where he wants to take Saudi Arabia economically, there's always sort of a, a great emphasis on economic integration in the region, uh, whether it has to do with the UAE or Egypt or even Qatar at the height of the blockade. And some of us who follow these things closely remember that even at the height of the blockade, MBS have made comments about seeing Qatar reintegrating into the economy of the region because that's his vision of where he wants to take Saudi Arabia in the region. And so Israel is, is, is a part of that region. It's a, a part of that reality. And it's a, it's a flourishing economy, one that it has access to high tech uh, that the Saudis also want access to. There's also, so there's one, the economic dimension of this. Uh, then there's the security dimension, uh, which is also something that the Saudis care about, particularly given two things, uh, sort of this threat perception from Iran uh, that continues to be pervasive throughout the Saudi establishment. And in fact, with any Saudi that you talk to, uh, you know, one, one, one Saudi businessman uh, very colorfully uh, told me once, he said, you know, we've never come under attack by the Israelis and the Israelis have never supplied any militia with rockets and grenades and missiles to attack us and, and attack our borders. Uh, it's always been the Iranians. So it's interesting for, you know, a Lebanese American like me that grew up very much sort of with the experience of the Israeli threat or uh, Israel on the borders and, and the conflict, uh, this sort of step back is like, oh, wow, yeah, and, you know, the Saudis sort of have a completely different view of this. They're not a confrontation state, never been a confrontation state, and their threat perception comes from elsewhere. Um, so, yeah, so the, the Iranian sort of threat perception, the feeling that that's a shared threat perception with the Israelis, and also, obviously, we sort of have played our part in this, in that our decision to pivot, step away, recalibrate, call it what you may but consecutive administrations wanting to um, scale back uh, American commitments to the region have certainly also left the Saudis and others looking elsewhere uh, to beef up their, their security and their security cooperation. And I think that sort of opened the door or at least incentivized Saudi Arabia and others to, to consider a security cooperation with the Israelis. So there's an economic incentive. There is a military and security incentive. Um, much of that is is already playing out. And so for those who talk about normalization as sort of a, a box to tick or a one-time flip the switch, it's actually a process. And there's a lot that's been going on. Uh, it's just beneath the surface. Quite a bit of it is not reported in the public domain, or at least if it's reported, it's only sort of policy wonks like us that pick it up and care enough to follow it. Um, and, and that's exactly how the Saudis want it. Uh, so to put it maybe a bit crudely, uh, I've heard that time and again that you know the Israelis want to kiss and tell, and the Saudis don't want to tell. You know, they they want this to remain behind closed doors. So there's a lot that's taking place. I think that um, sort of where some of the disconnect here. Uh, I think Greg just lost power. He must be in Beirut. Uh, <laughs> But um, if you could still hear us, Greg, I, I, yeah, I, can, like, I can hear you just fine. It's uh, I, I just keep going and I'm going to check my. Uh, oh, here you are. Yeah, the generator. Uh, I think it's just I think it's a problem with the fluorescent light. But anyway, we'll ignore it. So, I, I mean, part of what where the disconnect is and, you know, I penned a piece for the Middle East Institute where I had my hat recently on, on this issue is that I have the sense that there's unrealistic expectations on both sides. And the reason for that is that this process right now and where we are in the bilateral relationship between the US and the Saudis is, is driven by narrow political interests and, and agendas and timelines rather than the political reality on the ground. And so there's this renewed interest from the Biden administration to to leave behind uh, some legacy in the Middle East. And you know what better legacy is there than try to secure Saudi-Israeli normalization. You know, Saudi, um, key Arab, key Muslim state, G20 country, 
uh, pivotal when it comes to energy markets and the global economy. And so, you know, what better, better legacy than that if they can achieve that? And then the time horizon being driven again by sort of domestic American considerations, the election's coming up next year. And so ideally, this is something that they'd like to see um, concluded by the end of this year. Uh, you know, my good friend Dan Shapiro now has been sort of appointed as, as the person, he was my professor at Georgetown actually, was, you know, appointed to sort of um, head this uh, renewed effort. But it's completely disconnected from the reality on the ground, which is that the, Israel, the Saudis have to contend with public opinion. This is with all respect to, you know, Bahrain and, and the UAE and some of the other, uh, you know, countries out there, smaller countries out, out there. This is a country of 33 million people that's home to Mecca and Medina. And even though, you know, even given the authoritarian nature of the regime, they still have to contend with public opinion. Uh, and, and so this is not something that the Saudis can flip the switch and deliver on without some concrete steps from the Israeli side. And we all know where Israeli politics are right now. I mean, we're going through a, a historical pol political crisis in Israel. Uh, and Bibi Netanyahu sort of heads perhaps the most right wing government in the history of the country, uh, risks his, you know, his coalition if he is to attempt anything of, of any significance uh, towards the Palestinians and the Palestinians themselves are in disarray and the Palestinian Authority is unable to deliver and incapable on the questions about, you know, who comes after Mahmoud Abbas. And so there is no sort of this, this new push for normalization because of sort of where what the administration would like to deliver before next year is, I feel, divorced from the political reality on the Israeli-Palestinian side. And, you know, quite often I also find the Saudi uh, response to it interesting because the Saudis don't want to say no. And the sort of Saudi response is to ask for the moon in response. So it's like, okay, fine, we're willing to entertain this, but you know, we we want an alliance or we want an Article Five defense commitment or, and those are all you and I know are unrealistic and given the uh, political context here in, in the U.S., particularly uh, on the Hill, where Saudi Arabia remains deeply unpopular uh, because of human rights concerns, because of the legacy of the war in Yemen, and so to be able to deliver. Uh, a treaty, uh, an alliance, anything that looks like what we have with others uh, it, that needs to be ratified by Congress, it's just completely divorced from reality. Even in the context of normalization where you can have sort of, you know, Israel friendly, pro-Israel and evangelicals on board and the administration would mount maybe a, a, a pressure campaign to get some Democrats on board. I just don't think that they're, I mean, I think that they're gonna come out short on something like that. And I would just also, you know, tell the Saudis, and I would say, like, listen, the U.S. does not have a treaty alliance with Israel. Uh, you, you think that this is something that's uh, remotely uh, realistic from the Saudi context? I don't think so. So I think we're, we're finding ourselves in a position where both parties are talking these things up. Certainly, there's the issue of a nuclear uh, Aramco, or uh, as it's being dubbed, sort of uh, a, a joint venture, an American-Saudi joint venture on um, Saudi Arabia's quest for a civil nuclear program. And that's sort of also been bunched into this discussion of what can be delivered from the American side in return for normalization. And frankly, my, my take is that it's overblown, uh, it's overpromised, and it's unrealistic on both sides. And so we got to, in terms of wrapping this up with policy recommendations, I think we've got to sort of scale this back. A staggered approach is a much better approach for both sides and one that is closer to the realities on the ground and more likely to deliver. And so take, the, take some of these economic incentives, take some of these um, military incentives um, that the Saudis have and the Israelis also share and work on those. So I think the president did well for himself in delivering on an overflights on his last visit to Saudi Arabia last year. Um, there's been a number of Israeli, granted some of, most of them are dual citizens, at least as, as far as I know, but, you know, Israeli businessmen who, who are, who can be seen, you know, around Riyadh and, and, and Jeddah and, and looking for new opportunities given the economic changes in, in, in the kingdom. Um, so economics is interesting and sports. I mean, we've also seen the Saudis allowing Israelis in uh, in international 
given international platforms and sporting competitions. So, I mean, those are the kind of gradual staggered things that one can begin to push forward, hoping that the political reality in Israel, but also here in Washington for the Saudis can be more permissive of some of the bigger things that both sides want to see happen um, in the future. So I would, I would just sort of maybe quickly end by bringing in the issue of, of uh, the cooperation on the nuclear, civil nuclear program, because that's been bunched into the more recent discussion, the visits first by, you know, Amos Hochstein and Brett McGurk, uh, then followed by National Security Adv Advisor Jake Sullivan, finally capped by Secretary of State Blinken's visit about a month ago, maybe a month and a half ago or so. And so there's been a lot of legwork and investment from the administration. And as you mentioned, Greg, that it seems today that some, there are some senior administration officials that are visiting um, the kingdom. I would I would invest in the nuclear, civ the civilian nuclear project because simply because the Saudis have a lot of options uh, and they are just absolutely determined to make progress on that. It's part of their vision 2030. It's part of their economic diversification program. They want to free up much of the oil that is being used for uh, domestic purposes, for exports. We all know that the Saudis depend on desalination uh, for all their water needs. That's an energy intensive process. And so going nuclear makes a lot of sense. I'm not an expert uh, on, on these issues, on the technical side of things, but I know that they've signed MOUs with the Russians, with the Chinese, with the French, with the South Koreans. They have options. And I would sleep better at night from a non-proliferation standpoint, from uh, you know, promoting American economic interest standpoint, seeing this be an American-Saudi joint venture, call it Saudi Aramco, you know, a nuclear Aramco or, or otherwise. And I would completely separate that from anything having to do with normalization with Israel. I'll stop here and then I'm sure that we'll have much debate on these issues and I'm eager to, to hear Jonathan go, go about it. Thank you for us. Uh, yeah, that, that's an interesting point about the, the nuclear cooperation. I think we should probably uh, come back to that uh, and get Jonathan to use later. But uh, let me hand over to Jonathan for uh, for his introductory remarks. Thank you so much, Greg. It's a really a, a great pleasure to join you here. It's really fun to join for us. Uh, I always learn something listening to you talk for us. Um, so thank, thank you. Uh, it's interesting how Faras and I can see the exact same fact pattern uh, and come to slightly but significant different conclusions. Uh, I'm uh, a little bit more optimistic about what's in the realm of the possible. Um, to me, there's something about the Middle East where in these moments of chaos and tumult, uh, where no solutions seem uh, remotely on the horizon, um, they simply can appear. Uh, and I think uh, we don't have to look too far back in history uh, to see parallels where during the last administration, uh, Bibi Netanyahu had walked himself out onto a limb uh, with potential annexation of the West Bank. And it was an idea from Ambassador Yusuf Otaiba uh, that led to the Abraham Accords and otherwise allowed him to walk down out of the tree and create conditions that created this multilateral agreement. And just a few years later, uh, UAE is Israel's 16th largest trading partner. Uh, they're security partners. Israel has sold two air defense systems to UAE. Uh, and uh, there's a free trade agreement either already done or on the horizon. Uh, but uh, the relationship is only expanding. Um, other potential partners in the region see the success of that. And I think that certainly provides a great incentive uh, to, to, to see if they can replicate something similar. I will say I, I agree completely uh, with the tenor of Ross's comments that uh, this is really about integration. It's not about normalization. I think that's true from a U.S. perspective as well. Uh, if you flip into the like, around page 44 of the National Defense uh, uh, not, uh, 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 of the National Defense Strategy, excuse me, of the NDS, uh, and you get to the section on the Middle East, um, you'll see that this is really front and center, is that if the uh, onus uh, of uh, the burden of, uh, of military force capacity is going to be focused on uh, deterring uh, Russian aggression in Europe and otherwise blunting uh, or competing with uh, the pacing challenge of China, uh, something needs to uh, fill the gap of the opportunity cost of this outsized posture and presence 
uh, of the US military in the region. And the solution is to build the indigenous capacity of our partners to integrate their capabilities uh, such that uh, the whole is more effective than the sum of its parts. Uh, so regional security integration is that answer. Uh, General Carrillo has been very forward leaning on attempting to do this. He's made advances, but obviously um, integrating Israel, Saudi Arabia, and all of CENTCOM's partners uh, would be the thing that makes this most effective. Uh, when it comes also to talking about a U.S.-Israel-Saudi uh, uh, deal, uh, it's really sort of as Faraz describes, a U.S.-Saudi deal with a bit of an Israel cherry on top. Most of the um, prerequisite, prerequisites and demands are not of Israel. They're, they're major strategic concessions uh, the U.S. would otherwise have to make. Uh, they are, in the realm, as Faraz explains, potential security guarantees. They are, uh, in terms of security assistance, uh, the ability for... Saudi Arabia to buy uh, high level exquisite systems and also to get them in a timely fashion, which is a whole other problem that isn't just uh, one that belongs to the Saudis, but all of our partners uh, in the face of the defense industrial base uh, shortages that we, we face. Uh, and of course, then there is the potential uh, nuclear, civilian nuclear infrastructure component. Um, and then on top of that, there's the X factor of what uh, Mohammed bin Salman uh, will demand of the Israelis. And I've heard this two ways, actually. One, similar to, to Faras, I've heard that be because of the Arab street, the Saudi street, uh, and because of Saudi Arabia's role in the region, uh, he can't accept anything less than the Emiratis did in the Abraham Accords. So if they got um, three years with no annexation, uh, he needs something more than that. Um, I've also heard uh, and again, I'm not going to make any of these comments without uh, humbly deferring to my friend Faraz, who knows uh, Saudi Arabia uh, infinitely better than I do. But I have also heard theories that many of the questions and concerns uh, about what uh, MBS might demand of the Israelis are overblown and that uh, he is going to look to check the, the box, understanding that this deal is very much in Saudi's interest. Uh, and he has uh, a tremendous amount of favor among the population. Uh, Vision 2030 is, is widely lauded. The youth in Saudi Arabia seemingly love his leadership style, uh, is that he has a lot going for him, and that gives him a lot of latitude to make decisions uh, his father and his father's father before him never could have imagined. So um, I don't know the answer to that. I would defer to Faraz. Uh, Faraz clearly has an opinion, but it's unclear to me, and I've heard others say that it could actually go both ways. Um, I'll say on the issue of security guarantees in, in uh, Article 5, um, there is a, a lot that I think needs to be understood about uh, U.S. treaty guarantees in general, that really Article 5 isn't Article 5 uh, in the sense that um, it's never been uh, accepted uh, that uh, simply because we are in an Article 5 treaty that uh, if one of the uh, treaty participants uh, says we are at war, the U.S. is immediately at war. Uh, any declaration of war still requires yet another vote by the U.S. Congress. Uh, so there's always a degree of congressional oversight where, you know, there's no there's no race into to conflict without a, a vote from Congress, um, certainly uh, since, you know, the War Powers Re Resolution of 1973. Um, that said, I'll also say we, we might want to think a little bit creati uh, creatively about legislatively how Congress could insert itself into an agreement, uh, provide an ongoing oversight role uh, that does perhaps make this possible. And the irony here is I would point to an agreement with a different country that happened a few years ago in which there was also an attendant piece of legislation that provided Congress the oversight of that agreement uh, that required uh, the president to certify and guarantee that uh, the other treaty partner was doing certain things uh, and then uh, when there was a shift in policy, uh, the law worked as it was supposed to, and, and the president was able to renege from the agreement. Uh, now, without actually, you know, talking about any of the content of JCPOA of Inara, that's a model that could potentially work here when we think about the U.S. entering into some sort of agreement that then requires the president to certify Saudi Arabia as continuously doing certain things uh, that then would unlock certain benefits from the US. Uh, so uh, it's not unprecedented in that sense. And I think uh, there is a there there if we think creativity, creative, creatively about it. 
Uh, another element uh, we'd have to consider, and uh, we'd have to bring Israel into this too, is uh, what this means for Israel's qualitative military edge, uh, which is enshrined in US law. Uh, does this require some sort of trilateral working group to otherwise come to agreement about what systems uh, the US and Israel can collaboratively agree uh, to sell Saudi Arabia, if we're talking about F-35 or advanced air, def air defense systems, for instance. Um, so th there's an element there. And, and obviously, uh, as Faraz touched upon, uh, the major X factor uh, is, is, is Israel and, and specifically Bibi Netanyahu. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu returned to office late last year um, with really three major uh, policy platform items. One, he wanted to lower the cost of living for Israelis. He wanted to increase Israel's military capability to deter Iran's nuclear pursuit. And he wanted to normalize with Saudi Arabia. And uh, it was very clear that when he went on, you know, Al-Arabiya uh, and spoke very highly of MBS uh, and chastised the U.S., saying it was his number one priority to tell President Biden that the U.S. had to stabilize its relationship with Saudi Arabia, that this is where his head was at. Uh, and then immediately um, he went in a completely different direction and he became fixated on judicial overhaul. And uh, his cabinet uh, has brought things to the brink uh, in the West Bank and violence is at uh, a pretty historic high. Um, and Israel is in a period of political crisis and tumult based off of the ju judicial overhaul. Um, that on one hand could make it seem to partners like Saudi Arabia and other Gulf states as whoa, is Israel this uh, symbol of stability and military capacity and capability that we've long believed? or uh, they have in their Jewish spring over there and maybe we take a wait and see approach. Uh, it's, it's, it's a good question. This could have a stultifying effect on the pursuit of any deal. On the other hand, um, is this another situation where Bibi has got himself up a tree and this very deal is the way that he extricates himself from his political crisis? Um, and it wouldn't be with this coalition. It would obviously require a breaking up of this coalition, outreach to uh, Benny Gantz and Yair Lapid, uh, who so far have said they will not enter in a coalition with Bibi, but would otherwise potentially be supportive of things that were for the benefit of Israel with respect to normalization. So there is also a there there as well. Um, so putting that all together, uh, yeah, does it appear like a Hail Mary? Uh, sure, but it's the Middle East, uh, and Hail Mary passes get thrown all the time, and in a region where decisions are often made by autocrats who can move very quickly, um, you know, it, it, it's not in the realm of impossible, and I'll leave it there. And thank you, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, that also seems to be the, uh, the Biden administration's view, given the amount of senior staff time uh, that they've been putting into this of late. Uh, I'm going to start out with a, a few questions which I've been thinking about and then uh, go and take some questions from the audience. Um, first one, and this is primarily for Faraz, on the Saudi side, you, know, you mentioned that they need to be responsive to public opinion. Obviously, we're not going to get major progress on a two-state solution anytime in the near future. What sort of formulation would it take to get over or at least near the bar for MBS, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the way that Jonathan put it is that it, it, that's the X factor. Um, and I think it's the X, X factor by design. I mean, I think this is maybe something that we can refer to as strategic ambiguity. The Saudis, I think, want us to be out there wondering what the right price will be uh, in terms of concessions from the Israelis towards the Palestinians to get them on board. And you're right, even, even those of us, and you know, Jonathan is a, a connoisseur of the Middle East too, and so are you, Greg, but even those of us who watch Saudi and the Middle East very closely are left scratching our heads thinking, well, which is it? Does he, is he this new breed of sort of Saudi leaders that is driven by Saudi nationalist interests and economic interests? Um, or does he have this sort of Arab nationalist element in him where he really does care about the Palestinians uh, and also wants to contend and deliver in terms of Saudi public opinion? And I don't think we have the answer to that question, but I do think that the Saudis are very cleverly playing on that. Uh, you know, we have a public opinion to contend with, we need to deliver, it needs to be substantive, 
it cannot be what the Emiratis got, got, which is sort of a, a hold, a freeze on annexation for a certain period of time. It needs to be significantly more substantive than that. And then I think also there's this dimension that I kind of alluded to, which is that Saudi Arabia is not Bahrain or the UAE in geopolitical terms. So there's this real and genuine concern among Saudis that this will hurt them, not only domestically, but internationally. They think about sort of more populous uh, Muslim countries further east. They think about Pakistan, they think about Malaysia, they think about Indonesia, certainly, I mean, Iran, uh, countries that are going to try to outflank them in terms of Islamic credentials uh, and to take pot shots on them. And so they think about their position, the position of the kingdom in the broader Arab and Islamic world, and how that can potentially be undermined as part of this normalization with Israel. And I think rightfully ask the question, well, you know, if we're going to risk that, what's the right price? Uh, you know, we're not going to do it for a suspension of annexation for, for a year or two. It's just not, not worth it. And this is kind of where you start also getting all kinds of things in the mix, mix and getting into the U.S.-Saudi bilateral relationship. Well, maybe there's a defense commitment and whatnot. But I think these issues are genuine. They're not just constructed for purposes of leverage. Uh, I think they're real but they're also being cle cleverly utilized. And uh, there's a bit of a strategic ambiguity where Jonathan and I and you are kind of left scratching our heads. Yeah, I, I, I agree and uh, tend to see them having a hard time overcoming that uh, this year. Um, yes, it, the other things are much more doable, I guess, in my view. Um, the next question I'd like to, to address to both of you, and that is, you know, with the March agreement on Saudi-Iran diplomatic normalization and reduction of tensions around the region. Um, a Saudi-Israel normalization seems to somewhat pull in the opposite direction. Are those incompatible or what would happen with Saudi-Iran detente if this worked? So um, I, I'll just take a stab at it and then you know, very curious for Faraz's opinion here, but I don't think these things are are, in, are are contrary. Certainly not from a Saudi position. Uh, I think they they are very much uh, in parallel, and that makes a lot of sense. Uh, on the one hand, it is very much in the interest of Saudi Arabia uh, to reduce tensions with what it sees as a bit of a crazy neighbor. Uh, there's a lot of uh, opportunities for Tehran to make. Uh, Saudi Arabia, a very difficult place. I mean, we saw that certainly in 2019 with the attacks on Saudi Aramco. Uh, certain, certainly seen it in terms of their ability to, to move weapons and material to support uh, the Houthis in Yemen. Um, and a host of other ways that Iran can create mayhem uh, in the region. Uh, so outreach, uh, diplomatic rapprochement, anything that uh, throws Iran a bone by giving them some degree of international legitimacy in exchange for quiet um, is in the Saudi interest, while at the same time, uh, Saudi Arabia will move quite assiduously to build, a, build up its own military capacity to be able to neutralize the very threat that, that Iran poses, whether it's doing it with the US, China, uh, Korea, Turkey, uh, and potentially Israel, as the Emiratis have done. So I think actually uh, one need not preclude the other from a Saudi perspective. Uh, these two things move in parallel quite comfortably. Ross, do you have anything to add there? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be boring here and just completely agree with Jonathan, but I will add uh, some more meat to those bones. Um, I think, one, this is a case where you differentiate between the tactical and the strategic. Uh, and so when it comes to this detente with Iran uh, via Beijing, I think this is very much tactical and short term on behalf of the Saudis. Uh, we have found ourselves sort of in a period in the region where um, we know that the U.S. is preoccupied. You know, we're, we're worried about Ukraine. Uh, much of the pipeline in terms of defense and, and military is, is focused on this war on the European continent, certainly in the context of great power competition, Taiwan, China. And so there is this sense of, of increased vulnerability uh, that even when it was the Trump administration and the attacks on the Abqaq oil facilities happened, you know, the Trump administration didn't really react in a way that, that you know, lived up to expectations. So let alone now with a democratic administration and the war in Ukraine and great power competition. So there is that sense of exp exposure or vulnerability. And certainly what was happening with Iran is just that sort of, you know, the. The nuclear talks are at a deadlock. There's much unrest domestically within Iran. 
And there was a lot of intelligence. I mean, we all know, remember the Wall Street Journal reports in November of last year. I mean, I've sort of also privy to some private discussions with European uh, allies who had picked up intelligence of major attacks being prepared. And so there was concern about Iran lashing out and the US you know, being absent. And so from a tactical standpoint, the Saudi view was, well, why don't we put a Band-Aid on it and buy ourselves time, bring in the Chinese. It was proposed in December during uh, uh, President Xi's visit to, to the kingdom. And the Saudis picked up on that and, and ran away with it. I think that's not to be confused or conflated at all with where they can potentially be with us and with the Israelis and where normalization can lead. I think that's much more of a strategic direction that the kingdom has decided to pursue and is that direct, is tied directly into Vision 2030 and where MBS wants to take the country. I would also very quickly add, and I think my previous comments about how MBS is sort of this new breed of, of Arab, new generation of Arab leaders, MBZ in the UAE might might also qualify, and maybe Tamim also, Sheikh Tamim in, in, in Qatar, much more concerned about economics and development sort of rather than the geopolitics of things, um, is that it's opened up space for the foreign minister, Faisal bin Farhan, uh, to also sort of chart a course for the kingdom in terms of foreign policy that perhaps otherwise wouldn't be there. And it's been very interesting, sort of this constant talk about a new vision for the kingdom as a middle power, as opposed to being a satellite state of the US, which is kind of historically maybe how things were during, certainly during the Cold War, phone calls coming in from Washington, asking the Saudis for favors on this and that. Um, and that they now kind of sort of want to chart their own path. And that includes not only economic diversification, but also diversifying their foreign policy options. And we see that in the relationship with, with Russia and, and China, but also some of our European allies and partners. And it kind of sort of fits into that uh, prism, right? So, you know, we'll pursue normalization with the Israelis. We'll keep saying that we're interested and we are genuinely, but we'll also pursue the talk with the Iranians. Uh, we'll do both. <laughs> uh, and so it's part of this sort of, I think, broader vision that Prince Faisal bin Farhan, the foreign minister has sort of laid out for the kingdom, which is more complex and richer and sort of more sort of fits in where, where the Saudis see themselves today on the geopolitical stage compared to, uh, years prior. Yeah, they're, they're both positive, uh, at least in my opinion. Um, that's a good segue into where I wanted to take the discussion next, because we haven't really gotten into much on the background. Uh, you know, the, the background for all of this is the new multipolar or bipolar or whatever you want to call it world and the US-China competition, including for influence in the region. Um, you know, one thing, just to digress for a second, um, you know, the, the Saudi-Iranian talks had actually started under Iraqi auspices back nearly two years ago, which I think is an important point. This was not something that was a Chinese initiative. They came into it and may have been important to sealing the deal, but it was something that the Saudis had started, you know, Saudi, Saudis and Iraqis had started that dialogue with Iran. Uh, Greg, the Omani, the Omani tribe yeah. before them too also. The Omani yeah. Yeah. So it was something that they were already thinking about uh, rather than coming from China. But, but my next question goes back very specifically to China and to the issue of military ties. Um, you know, there, there has been this obvious playing off of US influence versus, well, we have an alternative arms supplier now. Um, and China certainly has reached a level of sophistication in conventional arms that they are a plausible alternate supplier if they wanted to be that. Um, but now that they're there, they also have seemed to limit their sales to the region and particularly to US partners in the region to ballistic missiles, drones, things that we have not been willing to sell them exactly what they wanted or at least not as, as sophisticated as they wanted. And so my question here is, do you think, and this is you know, primarily for Jonathan, but for us, you can weigh in as well. Do you think that the Chinese actually want to become more of a primary supplier and willing to sell current generation fighter aircraft and such, uh, or would they hold back from that? Because that really, that, that comes to the question of uh, whether this is more of a bluff or whether we should take that as a serious option. Well, I think it's important to recognize that China fundamentally thus far has played a different role in the region 
uh, than the U.S. historically, right? I mean, uh, in terms of trading partners, uh, a massive trading partner for uh, Iran and also the primary consumer of Saudi oil. So there is something to be said uh, about not necessarily fomenting uh, conflict between two critical trading partners in the region by potentially arming both. Uh, to say nothing of, there's a high cost to that uh, on the on the global scene, uh, certainly uh, with the U.S. and Europe. Um, and then, you know, why put themselves in a position where they're always going to make someone mad, right? I mean, I, I think they're going to be rather strategic in their approach uh, and, and somewhat thoughtful. Uh, from a Saudi perspective, I also would open it up and say it's not really uh, a U.S.-China question, uh, Saudi Arabia has opened up the shuk uh, globally. Um, I believe um, there's an agreement. I mean, virtually every every country on the peninsula now has an agreement with Bicar to create a factory that will produce uh, UAVs in their country. I don't think you can buy a TB2 for the next three years. The wait list is so long. Uh, I think Korea, France... Um, and to say nothing of their efforts to build uh, an indigenous military industrial base as well. So uh, I think it's it, it's it, it's an all approach, not uh, a U.S. China uh, dynamic necessarily. Yeah, that, that's a good point. But I do think, in terms of uh, you know aircraft, you keep rebuilding your fighter aircraft uh, base on a non-Western supplier still seems to me to be something that would be difficult. I agree. That would be an incredibly long pull in the tent. And I mean, this is this is where kind of, you know, frankly, um, Congress has to wake up a little bit and understand that uh, Saudi flies F-15s. And I believe it was during the Obama administration, the last security assistance package for maintenance and parts on those aircraft came through. I, I might be wrong, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm not. Um, but ultimately, those, those, those deals are going to be renewed. Uh, and Clearly, as, as Faraz made, made mention of, Saudi Arabia, based off of its human rights concerns, based off its activity in the war in Yemen, uh, has not covered itself in glory in the halls of Congress. Uh, but Congress is going to have to make a strategic decision about uh, how it wants to support this partner. And ultimately, uh, the cost of not doing that, they need to be clear-eyed. Uh, it's it is an acceptable position to stand by and say, as you know, I'm going to view the region strictly through the paradigm of, of human rights, and therefore I will isolate this country. I mean, that's, that is a way to go. Uh, but there's a cost to be had for U.S. national security interests that uh, we should enter, uh, you know, enter into that quite clear-eyed uh, if we do make that choice. As, as a realist, I broadly agree. Uh, I, I, have a, I have a somewhat differentiated view on some of the specifics, but we can't build our, our policy in the region around trying to, to democratize or, or promote human rights. Those are not the only objectives we have. I mean, the, que the question uh, to me in some part is, um, do we want to have, you know, the Saudis want a freer access to these arms sales and that they've talked about potentially having, you know, less congressional review and some mechanism where that would be uh, accomplished. Um, you know, and that's that's something I understand why they want it, uh, but uh, you know, it seems difficult from the U.S. side to envision that happening. Do you think so? Yeah, no, I think that's an impossibility. You know, there there is no. I mean, everything they want runs through Congress. I mean, it, it is the Congress that ratifies treaties, right? So, I mean, ultimately, um, they need to step up their game uh, in you know coming to Congress, making the case for themselves, as other Middle Eastern partners have done incredibly well. Uh, other other leaders who come through Washington are incredibly well received uh, in Congress, and so it's not an impossible task. Uh, it can be achieved, um, but at the end of the day, I think there has to be a degree of acceptance that Congress is going to play a major role in this. And trying to win, you know, hearts and minds in the halls of Congress is probably an easier, uh, if not difficult, mission, but certainly an easier mission than trying to write off Congress entirely and work strictly with the president. I think that might have been MBS's mistake in the early years of the Trump administration, thinking, well, I have a great friend in President Trump, uh, therefore uh, he'll deal with Congress and I'll be fine. That was a miscalculation. I think perhaps at the time he didn't quite understand uh, just how much Congress could limit uh, US uh, Saudi security assistance. Um, it has a major role to play in everything that uh, the kingdom wants. Yeah, and that may also mean at some point that if you want F-35s, you end up getting F-15s again. Uh, you have some of those limitations. 
uh, that specific one. So to broaden the question about China, you know, the, the other side of this is business and finance and energy. And, you know, there, there, there has been, an, you know, there, there have been pieces out there, uh, you know, that uh, Ali Shehabi had, had written one that I saw uh, recently. They basically argued that this would, this, if we were forthcoming on the Saudi asks for normalization, this would get, regain a lot of lost U.S. influence uh, that has taken place as a result of some of their frustrations with us in recent years, which are understandable. Um, I guess my question is, looking at the oil and financial and investment flows, which are overwhelmingly Asia right now, and I, I won't bore you with a lot of numbers on the oil side, but that's dwindled down to, to very de minimis numbers. How, how, how much influence would it really buy back if the U.S. were to satisfy them on those issues? Uh, I'll start, start with Faraz on this one. Yeah, I'm happy to ask that to answer that question. I also want to chime in on the previous one. So maybe I'll start with sure. that, but please remind me to come back to, to this one. I just want to say that yeah, we, we, were, we spent quite a bit of time talking about Saudi public opinion as it relates to normalization. I mean, how could we not talk about American public opinion and Congress where these things count that much more and where the Saudis have lost so much ground over you know, the last couple of years with, you know, Jamal Khashoggi's assassination, the arrest of, of the woman activist and the whole lot that came with it. Uh, but they've clawed back some territory. They've made some improvements. And at least there's been no mistakes, uh, no major uh, issues since then, winding down the war in Yemen, uh, making sure a truce is still in place. And so there's been some progress, but clearly there's still a lot of the way to go in terms of being able to realize and, and get access to some of what they're, they're looking for, particularly in the security dimension uh, from when, when it comes to the US. In terms of China, I wanna say that sort of that lack of, of access and, and, and sort of problematic relationship with Congress doesn't necessarily need to translate, oh, well, then they're gonna go to the Chinese uh, or fall in the lap of the Russians. Uh, it's not the, the diversification of foreign policy options and, and military options does not begin and end with China uh, and Russia. And I think sort of the, the biggest beneficiaries of this reality that's only been accentuated by the war in Ukraine and the fact that so much sort of our, our military hardware right now is the pipeline is just straight straight to Ukraine. Uh, and that is de delaying even further any, any ability to deliver to some of the other allies. I think the, the greatest beneficiaries of that have been some of our European allies. I mean, the French are cleaning house. Uh, the British are doing great too in terms of selling arms and equipment to not only the Saudis, but also the Emiratis and others in the Gulf. And it's easier, it's an easier pill for us to swallow. The Saudis, I've heard them say time and again, is sort of when we can't go US on, on security and arms, we go US adjacent. Uh, so, you know, we'll go to the French and we'll go to the Germans and we'll go to the, to the Brits before we go knocking on, on Chinese uh, doors. So, I mean, I think that, yes, there's going to continue to be uh, military cooperation with China. You know, the state of the war in Ukraine for the Russians, I don't know how much there'll be with Russia. But that's sort of part and parcel of this diversification and sort of being open to dealing with all. But there's no doubt that, you know, strategically their preference continues to be us. And what they can't get from the U.S., I think the Europeans stand to benefit from that. Now, you asked me a question, and I forgot it. For, totally so, for, so the the next question, me. and apologies for, for skipping over you on the uh, the arms supply one. No, no, it's um, fine. But, uh, the, the broader question was, given how much influence would the U.S. get back by solidifying the security relationship as part of the normalization package, given that the oil flows financial inflows and investment inflows are overwhelmingly Asia and China now. And that that's not going to change. I agree that that's not going to change just given the economic reality of things. But does the, um, does the political side change despite yeah, that? Here's one of the more interesting things I, I've learned recently, not, not from Saudis, but from others in the region. Um, if you sort of look at FDI flows, um, the picture is very clear. Uh, the Saudis and others in the Gulf make most of their money from selling energy and oil east, and they invest most of that money in the West, primarily in the United States. And I think that's something that the American economy benefits quite a bit from and stands to benefit even more. I think that's something that, um, that can be affected by the status of the bilateral 
relationship. And, you know, buddies can bet some of that money elsewhere and invest it elsewhere. And so I think it's sort of a, an FDI, where does the money go component to this equation in terms of influence and, and American ability to, to benefit economically? There are only things that we do to also uh, be a thorn in our side. Repeated uh, Chinese requests for uh, oil to be sold, not only sort of in, in US currency, but also in, in the yuan um, and a basket of other currencies. There are certain things out there that the Saudis can do to be a thorn on, in our side, it should, should they choose to. I don't think it's in their interest. I don't think it's in our interest. That's why I, I, I'm, I'm a supporter of sort of moving this relationship forward. I think it's key and strategic for both. It's just about finding that, that right formula. And I do think that sort of just being Middle Eastern myself and having grown up both in Lebanon and in Saudi Arabia, I mean, there is a personal dimension. Uh, you cannot escape personalities, uh, especially in that part of the world. And, you know, the, the, the relationship is not a friendly one between President Biden and, and, and MBS. Uh, the two men don't like each other. <laughs> They've said a lot of things about each other and they mean quite a bit of it. Whereas it's a much more positive relationship with President Xi. And, and I think, yes, the authoritarian nature of various regimes helps people, you know, strike deals. And I think that plays a part too. Jonathan? Yeah, I, I would add, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll throw something out here and just say that um, less about oil and perhaps about maybe some, some of the, the, the future critical minerals. I mean, uh, if you ask someone like Amos Hochstein, uh, who's out there uh, and wishing he had uh, you know, a, a public investment fund for the US in which he could go and disrupt maybe some of China's investments in Africa and elsewhere on you know, uh, rare earths and critical minerals, um, there's a, immense potential in working with the Saudis to uh, use their economic resources to you know, purchase you know, some of these critical minerals and prevent China from getting the world's monopoly on, on, on the very minerals and metals that are going to define success in the next century. Uh, whereas with oil in the century before that, um, it, it's going to be lithium, copper, nickel, and uh, all of these metals. And if China uh, owns all the mining rights throughout the world, uh, or the vast majority, um, that's strategically quite damaging for the West. So looking not just at Saudi Arabia for the energy it provides the world today, uh, but just the investment potential it has, uh, and they're potentially a very willing and able partner already. I mean, you know, they, they recognize uh, where the market is and, and, and you know, they've purchased minority stakes in a number of countries. I know they've par partnered with the UK looking at um, critical mineral um, supply chains. So, I mean, this is this is something where we need to be paying more attention, I think. So now I'm gonna to go to questions from the audience and I'll, I'll start with one from uh, Laura Rosen. And she, she asks, can someone explain why a US-backed Saudi-Israel normalization integration deal significantly benefits the American people? I see from the Israeli side and possibly the Saudi side, but not really what Americans de get depending on the cost. These are not countries that need to de-escalate with each other. This is an area where the lobbyists and politicians seem out of step with many of the American people. Um, well, hi, Laura, it's nice to, nice to hear from you. I can't see you, but it's nice to hear from you. Um, I'll, I'll say this, um, th th there are a number of answers, um, but, I'll, but I'll give one. Um, currently, uh, there's roughly 35,000 US troops spread throughout the Middle East. Uh, and that posture and presence um, is, is largely of a vestige of a time when we were there to fight Ba'athists, but it's there nonetheless. And its presence has creeped from fighting the Ba'athists to fighting uh, violent extremist organizations, including Al Qaeda and ISIS. But ultimately, probably more strategically at this point, the vast majority are there as a form of assurance to our partners who host them, that if things go bad, uh, we're there, we can be quickly in the region and we can do things. Ultimately, I think that is uh, hugely costly and the opportunity cost of maintaining that force presence uh, in both human treasure and blood is significant. Uh, and we have a duty to replace that with greater indigenous capabilities among these partners. And part of that is building up trust and partnerships, multilateral among our partners, such they can carry a greater degree of the burden. 
Um, I don't think it's necessarily necessarily fair for many of these partners to demand that we stay in the capacity that we do as they seek to modernize their militaries while in, you know demanding that we you know maintain bases uh, of infantry troops and armor that will have no meaningful role uh, if there's a conflict with Iran that are all well within the range rings of virtually every type of Iranian ballistic missile that will be useless and indefensible. Um, so this makes sense even for future conflicts that we'd be rethinking our posture presence in a way that benefits uh, our, our strategic needs. Um, and I understand there is uh, quite a lot of resistance in Congress to providing some of these partners with the weapons they need. But at the same time, what gets ignored is that the status quo requires a continued US presence. And so what we're trading for you know, keeping our hands clean and otherwise not selling some of these partners what they need is that the US military, uh, US service members are carrying the burden. And I don't think that's a fair cost. Ross, did you have anything to add there? Listen, I, I, first, shout out to Laura, too. Hi, Laura, we can't see you, but uh, good to feel your question. Uh, I can't answer that question as, as well as Jonathan just did, but uh, I will say the following. I mean, this idea, this notion out there, even if sort of the, the average American does not understand, does not care, or does not see their own personal interest, direct connection to the Middle East, this sort of broader idea that the Middle East doesn't really matter, and we can unplug and, and walk away from it is just total utter fiction. And I think most of us, including Laura, understand that geopolitically, it's, you know, it's called the Middle East for a reason. It sits right there in the middle between three key continents. Uh, so much of the global economy depends on energy that comes from that part of the world. There is at least three maritime choke points that are just vital for global commerce. And in the era of great power competition, just unplugging and, and seeding much of that away to whether it's Chinese, Russian, or otherwise, or Iranian influence, just does not seem to me to be geopolitically the right thing to do from a US interest perspective. It's geopolitical folly. And so for all these reasons, we need to continue to be engaged. And certainly as Jonathan very uh, eloquently outlined, it's much more in our interest to be engaged while this part of the world is as pacified as possible and stable and more integrated. And that includes these normalization processes that are unfolding among some of the Arabs and, and Israel. Yeah, I think it also, also is an important point that oil is fungible and what really matters for it, the economic damage is price. Um, and so, you know, it, it, despite the fact that we're protecting China's oil, as some people would say, um, that's not really how the market works or the economy works. Um, I have another Greg, question. I, I, if I may, I mean, I've heard it put otherwise by some of our, our leading military uh, generals, which is that, you know, we want to maintain uh, our, our boot on China's access to energy and much of its energy. And, that, and that's, a, that's an important related point, um, because we, you know, in extremists, we have the ability to compel um, embargoes, which wouldn't otherwise happen. That is a very, very, very important point. Um, Last question here, because uh, I know we're, we're coming up on the, the one hour mark, uh, from Emir Tibon from Haaretz, um, and he asks, what does Biden's see, team see that causes them to go all in on this, sending Sullivan, McGurk, Hochstein to Saudi again and again, despite conditions both panelists agree on, far-right government Israel, anti-Saudi Senate and Congress, huge Saudi demands from US. Uh, for us? Yeah, I mean, I think Jonathan and I have had some of these conversations offline. It's kind of scratching our heads it's like, do they see something that we don't see? What is it that they know that we don't know? And for the life of me, I mean, most of the conversations that I've had on both sides of that equation, you know, the Saudi and, and, and the American. No, I mean, it seems like folks like us and Jonathan are, and, and I and you are kind of relatively clued in on the broader outlines of what is being discussed here. Um, I, I don't know if this is a case where both sides don't want to say no and want to go fishing and uh, everybody, well, you know what? Yeah, we're open to normalization and we're absolutely, you know, key and fits into our sort of broader strategic picture. But in return, we want them, you know, the stars on the moon. And if you can deliver that, we're on board. So I don't know if there's a bit of that that's taking place and that concerns me uh, because we do want to sort of set realistic expectation. And I think it's much more likely to yield results, as I say. Or there is truly this sort of these hidden aspects to, to what's being discussed. And 
um, senior U.S. officials spending so much of their time in the kingdom, including today, that we're not uh, aware of. I sure hope if sort of if I'm to sort of if I was in the shoes of sort of the U.S. officials that they're more focused on the civil nuclear energy piece of this, because I think that's real and the Saudis have options and it's it's a priority for them, part of their vision. And I do think that there's an interest in having the U.S. in there rather than some of our competitors in there, rather than sort of this unrealistic normalization piece where the Saudis would get a great deal in terms of U.S. security assistance and assurances in return of that. I think that might be some way off still. Yeah, although that, that the nuclear side of that is also a bit of a hard sell in Washington, the absent of one, two, three agreement like we had with the Emirates. Um, Jonathan? Yeah, I would say he's punishing them because it's July in Saudi Arabia and therefore very hot. Um, I kid, of course. Um, I think, uh, you know, uh, this is a stupid adage, but so somehow in the Middle East, it's always darkest before the dawn and uh, tides can turn rather quickly. Um, when dealing with Saudi Arabia, ultimately, or UAE or, or one of these autocratic states, um, you, you need, you know, to, to, to change the mind of the leader. Uh, you need to be able to solicit information and therefore uh, ideas come quickly and also decisions are made incredibly quickly. Um, we've seen that. Uh, also, two consummate shuttle diplomats between Amos and Brett. Uh, who could have imagined that Amos would have been as successful as he was uh, in negotiating, you know, for his part in, in the Lebanon-Israel gas deal? I mean, who could have seen that coming? Um, Certainly not the Department of State or, or most uh, bureaucrats in the U.S. government would have ever even uh, sanctioned uh, such a negotiation, right? I mean, I think there's a degree of ambition which is required to make things like this happen. Similarly, um, Netanyahu had walked himself into a pretty difficult position uh, right before uh, the Abraham Accords broke open. So I, I think as of right now, I mean, the polling that I had seen is that if, if elections were held again today, uh, the current coalition, which has 64 seats out of 120, would have something like 54 or 52. Uh, we've got an unpopular government, um, clearly uh, an unpopular turn of events with judicial overhaul that is you know, bleeding the country societally. Um, if someone can hand Netanyahu a parachute that allows him to blow up this coalition while potentially some sort of deal that saves himself from prison, uh, he might jump at it. Uh, I don't think this is necessarily as crazy as it may seem if we have uh, a bit of uh, stupid ambition to think, you know, we, we could pull this off. Uh, so, yeah, despite the fact that nothing looks good, um, that might be the very thing that helps actually deliver the Hail Mary pass. I guess we'll all see uh, as uh, the next year goes on. Stranger things have happened. Um, since we're a little bit over the hour, I'm going to go ahead and, and wrap up here. Uh, thank you to Faras and Jonathan for taking the time to join us this afternoon. Um, and I hope all our viewers have found this conversation as enlightening as I did. I'd like to mention that this discussion will be posted on YouTube and on the Center for the National Interest website if anyone wants to recommend it or post a link on social media. Thank you. And that concludes our session.